Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. 25 years. I can't believe it. February 17, 1995 is when my all-time favorite movie, Heavyweights, was released. Yes. The movie that started it all. The movie that made Ben Stiller pretty much a household name, even though he was just uh, doing his TV series uh, that was short-lived with his buddy Judd Apatow. Also brought in the crew, well, three actors from the Mighty Ducks films, Aaron Schwartz, Keenan Thompson, and Sean Weiss. Not to mention this was Stephen Brill's directorial debut since he's the writer and the producer and he's an actor himself too. And you got an all-star cast joining in most of which who have lived or died. Yeah. I mean you got Tom McGowan was from the TV show Frasier, or before Frasier, but he was actually in a short-lived series called Down to Shore. You got Leah Leo, who's done some other work in her career. Paul Feig, yes, best known for, you know, directing episodes of the TV show that Judd Apatow had produced, Freaks and Geeks. But he went on to direct films of his own. He also wrote some screenplays as well. And he even became a producer. Went on to do Bridesmaids. He also did Undercompanied Miners. It was a Christmas comedy. Which I know Gia Mantegna was in. Yeah, the daughter of Joe Mantegna. But he also did uh, films like Spy, The Heat... Ghostbusters 2016 come to mind. Most of all, he produced the Peanuts movie. Yes. Which became my favorite too. <laughs> well, yeah. And you got a lot of familiar actors to join by. I mean, you got Peter Berg. Uh, you got um, Tom Hodge. Jeffrey Tambor. You know, from many uh, shows and movies, you know, like Freeze Company, The Ropers, Max Headroom, um, even the, um, the Larry Sanders Show, among others. Yeah, he's always been memorable. Of course, you got Ben Stiller's his parents, Jerry Stiller, and Ann Mira. Big couple together. And, uh... So many others. I mean, you can pretty much tell that they worked so hard to make this movie special. I know there's been so many summer camp movies that are as memorable as it could be, like Meatballs, and or even some horror camp comedies, or even a TV show on the Nickelodeon, Salute Your Shorts, but nothing can beat this. Nothing. But to me, this was um, the pinnacle of summer camp movies. Well, Meatballs is definitely the godfather of summer camp films. So let's put it this way. <laughs> this had like so many quotes that you can pretty much say it over, all over your head. Like, skinny wieners, chipmunks, download. Nobody... <laughs> Nobody's seen more butts than you, Uncle Tony, or Tony believes in you. Or percussizing. <laughs> Don't put Twinkies in your pizza. Don't put Twinkies on your pizza. I mean, that those sort of quotes. Yeah. That That's what made this film special to me. And what really made me special was that I think it really did spoke to me that yes, I was overweight, 
I've been struggling so hard to lose weight too. Trust me, it's not easy because I have to deal with food. But what can you do? And I can also see exactly why I like this movie so much was because you got a character, Aaron Schwartz, who's basically an underdog. You know? He's he's totally insecure with his weight problem. I mean people kept making fun of him. You know, especially in the opening too, where he misses the bus, he has to walk all the way across the street just so he can get back home, only to be chased down by a dog, had trouble trying to throw the baseball. And not not only that, but he's it's like a hot day, so he ends up drinking a whole pitcher of lemonade. <laughs> Until suddenly he gets a big surprise, which turns out to be a summer camp. But he wants to spend his entire summer vacation, do whatever he wants with his friends. Yeah, but that's the problem, I guess. Um... So. And I know I keep showing the Blu-ray, but yes, the Blu-ray came out in 2012. When I heard this was announced back then, I was like jumping for joy. I never thought I would see this film get a release. Because Disney has been putting out the same old DVD that's in full frame. No features whatsoever. It's basically the same print that you saw on the VHS tape. Only the quality on the DVD is... A mile upgrade but because if you look at the back look at those features right there look at this how could a film like heavyweights that didn't do very well at the box office could have so much features how is that possible simple Judd Apatow he had all the material, or Disney basically had the material, so they had the access to him. So that way it could all be put together on this one particular pristine quality high definition transfer. Plus, this is the first time you get to see this film in widescreen. Yes, the transfer is top notch pristine. It looks like a brand new movie when watching this. And I bet if this movie had looked excellent in 4K Ultra HD, and I hope it does if, it, if Disney had ever had a chance to release it, but I don't know how that's going to turn out. Because Disney a lot lately hasn't been pretty much the same. But you know, that's another problem too, because Disney has been putting out a lot of titles, but they've not been able to put anything in stores. Especially with features. So we have to end up getting them at Disney Movie Club or Amazon. We have to spend an arm to lake. But anyway, <laughs> I'm sorry. But that's the, the, the top story here. But you get pretty much everything that you never thought you would have. Like, you get deleted scenes that's like two hours long. How could they actually do that? Exactly. I mean, they know they were having fun. Um, so it's like 30 deleted to extended scenes. You got an audio commentary, which had Judd Apatow, Stephen Brill, Alan Colbert, Aaron Schwartz, Sean Weiss, Tom Hodge, and even Paul Feig join in. Um, I know they could have got Ben Stiller to join in. I think Jerry Stiller would have been available too, but I, I understand. I know they could have got other cast members, but they couldn't. You got the making of Heavyweights, a very long featurette that was really cool, very special. You had a Super 8 footage shot by the cast and crew, so they, they all put together right there. Um, you actually got the video chat with Judd Apatow and Keenan Thompson, all done in Skype. Not perfect, I know, but it's the best they could do. Um, you get to see exactly where 
they are now. All the cast members from the movie, you know, the kids. And they got to, exp to explain everything, too. You got a lot of photo gallery, f all the sets, all how they created it. They filmed this in North Carolina at a local camp. I mean, they, they definitely put in a lot of good effort to it. Um, they spent like two months over there. They started filming on March 28, 1994. They finished it on May 25th, 1994. So this was like during the spring. Uh, not even though it's supposed to be summer, but yeah. <laughs> but it's perfect. Um, and... We, we learn about some of the stories that went into it, like, for example, Aaron Schwartz actually broke his arm. Um, I never thought I would hear that. It, that was the first time. So th that explains why, you know, the, the go-kart scene that he had to be covered, just so they, we don't see his cast. And it was during the scene where uh, they were having a party. You know, sort of in the tradition of, well... <laughs> bit of apocalypse now right there and there's a bit of uh, platoon in there too you know where you have um, Jerry Gardner you know just you know writing a a letter to his grandmother because of what's going on at camp since no one seems to care about what it what Tony Perk is doing so yeah okay uh, all right Yeah, there's the code. <laughs> and there's the disc. Upside down. <laughs> well, there's no artwork in it, but I can live with that. So. I know the cover art, they had to do some changes here. They still remain the same, as you saw from the the home video release where, where um, Aaron Schwartz... Uh, Cody Berger, Keenan Thompson, and Sean Weiss. You know, they were wearing, like, regular clothes, but in this poster, they're just wearing the Camp Hope uniforms. And on top of it, you have a sandwich, which you have, uh, that's supposed to be Tom Hodge as Lars, you know, all covered up. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then, of course, you got Ben Stiller, you know, already dressing up for hiking as Tony Perkins, and he's, like, putting the... But he's putting up the thumbs up. <laughs> yeah. That's actually good that they did that. I mean, I know it sounds kind of strange, but but it does make sense. I mean, Ben Stiller was the real star of the film. And he nailed it. I mean, he really nailed his performance as playing a fitness guru that's like a cross between Tony Little and Richard Simmons, a no-holds-barred type of guy who, you know, who thought that, you know, he's actually... At first, a nice guy, but but deep down of it, he's a total nut. I mean, he has bipolar. You know, he's uh, totally greedy, selfish, self-centered. I mean, this is the kind of guy you you're gonna have a hard time dealing with. I mean, the way he's he's torturing them. Even though he's trying to make them lose weight as hard as they can, I mean, this is hard. This is really tough. I mean, this, this guy is up to no good. You can tell how evil he is. Yeah. Even the deleted scenes explain it too, which I wish some of them were included. You know, it would have been nice if someone out there would actually take the deleted scenes. I know it's not perfect because. There's like so many time codes and a lot of property of Brenna Vista pictures, um, markings in there. But you know what would be really cool? If someone could take the high definition print of Heavyweights and inserted all the deleted scenes and just BAM! Make it into a director's cut or some sort. Like add some scenes that didn't quite make it or try to change some of the jokes. Like there was the, the Seymour Butts joke which that was <laughs> known as Peter Fitz. Yeah. Although I, I take the Seymour jokes uh, very well, but Peter Fitz would have been nice too. 
And the fact that there's even a joke uh, running around where they're about to check out with Nurse Drew, uh, Nurse Julie. Sorry, I can't talk right. Um, and which I know there's a bit of a reference to um, Basic Instinct. I never thought they would do that. This could have gave it a PG-13 rating, perhaps. Um, the boner scene. <laughs> yeah. Like, everyone's going to get a boner when they see Nurse Julie. <laughs> I, I have to admit, Nurse Julie is pretty hot. I mean, I, I can see why people were nervous. <laughs> Especially uh, Pat uh, Finkley. Uh, Pat Finley, when played by Tom McGowan, I mean, I, he, he has trouble <laughs> trying to get to know um, Leo, uh, Leah, uh, trying to get to know uh, Julie. You know, people do get nervous too. You know, <laughs> when they meet girls. I mean, especially babes. Now I know what Charlie Brown feels like when he was trying to meet the little redhead girl. <laughs> the story is simple. It's about a young kid who's overweight. They're just getting tired of being picked on and taking all the abuse that he was given. That, you know, he doesn't want to be dealing with this uh, insecurity anymore. I mean, at first he just wanted to have the biggest summer of his entire life, you know, hanging out with friends and all, until his parents um, signed him up for a summer camp called Camp Hope, which... He refused to go because he realized that it's just basically a camp for fat kids. And apparently, with all the fun activities that they had to do, yeah, they begin to lose weight in that particular fashion. He refused to go because, well, he, f he feels like, you know, they're going to humiliate him for the rest of his life. But the main reason why he he discovered it at first was because he saw the go-karts and go-karts he never had ridden one but he was so fascinated by it that <laughs> he always wants to go on there for some time to see how it runs and how it races how it goes fast but he, he knows that he's not the only one that's overweight that all the rest of the kids are actually you know cool classy um, just energetic, comedic, and, and just fun. You want to hang out with these characters. You really do. And But then we have to deal with um, a fitness guru that's exactly who he is. He's headstrong, um, narcissistic, self-centered, complete jerk of himself, all he focuses more on his infomercials instead of his uh, care for for the kids. That's all he's doing. You know, he's just doing this for the money. I mean, I know he's trying to help them out, try to make them lose weight, but all they really are trying to do is having to do something completely dangerous. I mean, the Perkis system that he came up with is this extremely dangerous. It could really hurt a child and everyone else and that's not something that they would deal with so they so he, he's really uh, killing them out there but they they had to take a stand I mean they realize they made their mistakes nevertheless they have self-control and that's the more important thing of them all was that they need to have self-control smart balance and and respect so that way you know they'll become you know winners instead of losers that was the key yeah. and that's what I learned about this film I really did and yes I'm basically gonna say this that it, it is the Citizen Kane of all summer camp movies face it they may love Citizen Kane okay alright everyone's well, it's Roger Ebert's favorite, too. It could be anyone's favorite. I mean, there's other favorite films out there that they can name of. But to me, it would always be this film. Okay? That's my Citizen King. I don't care. 
I may be an adult now. I'm not a kid anymore. But I still remember it by heart and by soul. You know, it made me laugh hysterically. I'll never get tired of it. Even if even if I live up to a hundred, if I could. A lot of memorable scenes in the movie. It, it definitely brought the spirit to it, like most uh, summer camp films. Um, I love how it does a take on on war films. Love that. I I just I get so hysterical having to see what Tony Perkis has to offer, you know, having to do all these dangerous stunts for them to lose a lot of weight. I know he's trying to help them lose weight so hard that they don't want to be able to uh, be as fat as ever, so they won't have any, you know, a lot of problems, you know, with a lot of pain and everything. But the way he's been treating them is incredibly rough. And you know it's going to be, they just can't take it anymore. They just can't stand having to not eat any f special food. They, they were starving to death. I mean, they, you know, they worked so hard, but they realized in the end, and they learned their lessons here, was that, yes, I know you're having the fun, the time of your life, and you're trying to do your best, to, you know, trying to, you know, live free for, for all you care, but at the same time, you still need to lose weight because if you, because think of what's going to happen to you once this goes on. I mean, yeah, you're going to end up getting a heart attack or, or so. A lot of, um, a lot of trouble. I mean, you don't want to end up like how huge um, the fattest boy in camp of them all, who doesn't speak much. He's basically a mute. But that's, if you had to be this huge, I mean like 500 pounds heavier, well, it's going to be hard to actually having to lay down on, on your uh, queen size bed or anything or, or even have trouble or having to sit down on a easy chair or whatever, probably end up breaking everything. <laughs> And they're not trying to make fun of fat people. I mean, they I know some people may say that, but to me, this is exactly what they had to go for. Some of them didn't look as as fat as you may think. I mean, yeah, they do have like like huge blubber, you know, like husky types. I mean, some of them look pretty chubby. Um, they didn't look that fat. I mean, they look like almost. A little skinnier than ever, but but I can I can see what they look like then. <laughs> um, and of course Jerry Gardner, you know the leader of the group here, is like is like 141 pounds, and I I used to weigh 141 pounds. That was uh, it didn't feel as I didn't feel as chubby as I think I would be. It would be like a little skinnier, but I was getting big. Too. Now, what does rely on to this film is that, yes, um, obesity is a common factor. You know, people have struggled so hard losing weight so they, that way they become exactly the right size, the figure. You know, they're trying to put on their own clothes to see how it fits perfectly and, and be able to feel confident and more relaxed, healthy stronger, built more muscle and strength, that sort of thing. I mean, you know, they've been insecure all their lives and depressed. You know, I mean, they, they enjoy eating, but at the same time, they just feel like, you know, I don't know if everything's worth um, r the risk in living at all. Um, but for the kids themselves, I mean, all they wanted was to have fun. I mean, they love all their the snacks, the chocolate, all all the all this junk food that they got. You know, <laughs> I mean, 
hey, they, they can't help it. I mean, they, they, they love to eat fast food. They love to um, eat a lot of uh, snacks that, you know, they, they just enjoy eating. They don't even care about, you know, how big they are. I mean, they know they're going to be big. But they also get nervous because of their problem, you know. They can't help it. But they also love to have fun doing all these um, summer camp activities, you know, like, and hoping they'll be able to become a winner. So no matter what happens, I mean, they'll never give up. So that's what I learned about this film. I mean, even if you're skinny or fat, I mean, that's what we had to achieve. And I think feel like this film really taught us something. And that's why it should be remembered by. Even with all the jokes aside. And the jokes were pretty much adult. I mean, it's a Disney film, but it has a lot of adult jokes in there. Like, I'm pretty certain there are kids out there who won't get the joke. Yeah. And... Apparently, Touchstone Pictures could have released this, actually, um, through the Caravan Pictures uh, company. If that was the case, but they wanted this to be a, a family film, so they want to keep it that way, in that particular level. And I'm glad they kept it that way. I mean, there's no nudity. <laughs> that's, that's a plus. I mean, we don't see any of that. But we do see sometimes, well, some shy nervousness and, I mean, or maybe a little bit of uh, <laughs> um, leering or anything. I mean, a lot of that. Or the intensity of them all. Yeah. Okay. I know, I, I know I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I just can't help it. I love this movie to death. Um, the cinematography looks incredibly stunning. It was done by Victor Hamber. Got to give him credit for that. He really knows how to shoot these scenes. Um, the score was done by J.A.C. Redford. Um, so it has a mix of all the other rousing scores for throughout the scenes here and there especially you know from the beginning especially when they they were getting into the middle of uh of how they enter camp hope or how they they went through all these uh terrorizing scenes with tony perkis or any other moments here or even at the end of the movie with the where now they're now they're going up to their own games, you know, they're about to compete against uh, Camp MPB. Yeah, because they're the ones that have been beating them completely. Yeah. And of course, I mean, there's a lot of funny scenes. Um, the baseball scene was just, <laughs> the fact that they had to compete with them was just, I don't know, it, it, it got me laugh out loud, hysterical. I, I laughed so hard. Even with the quote, we're percussizing. It's true. I mean, they, they really did suck at baseball. <laughs> they had trouble with it, too. They've been getting hurt. Painly. I mean, they get hit in the nuts. I mean, they hit in the back. or They had trouble swinging. And they they lost the bat. It, it hits um, Kenny the cameraman in the face while he was about to take a smoke. I mean, it's it's messed up. Um, anyway, uh, it has a wonderful soundtrack too, um, a mixture of 70s and 90s songs, if you can think about, uh, of course, the Camp Hope, uh, concerto, yeah, the, the theme, which Paul Feig joins, along with the rest of the, the Camp Hope, uh, team, which is the kids, of course, um, and, and then, yeah, because he was the one who also saved the dance uh, to the song Love Machine. 
And they had songs like Lafique, Saturday Night, You Sexy Fiend, uh, Hang Tough, Set the Wheels. Set the Reels in Motion, I Want Candy. Yeah, actually, that's from the 80s. So, yes, there's there's a lot of that. And, of course, Closer to Free, which was a theme song to um, Party of Five, the TV show on Fox. Uh, actually, it works pretty well for this film, too. Uh, the Blue, uh, the Naboo, yeah, during the, the scene in with the Blob, <laughs> or the... Yeah, the uh, Phoebe Magpies, I think that's what it was called. That was the song that was also heard. Yeah, the, the orchestra song that was heard in in the movie uh, A Clockwood Orange by Stanley Kubik. So they, they use it here for this film during the the party scene. <laughs> yeah, where they're going around, you know. <laughs> we, we have like... We have Tim just going around acting like a human s'more, <laughs> putting marshmallows and chocolate syrup over him, and that that sort of scenes. It's it's like wow, you know, you're really there, and it's in slow motion too. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, uh, with the cast aside, I mean, let's go back to to the cast. I mean, Aaron Schwartz. If you saw him today, though, he's as skinny as he could be. He went on to play the part of um, of a young version of Ego that was played by Kurt Russell in The Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. I, I find it hard to believe that was him, but they just used his image with CGI in the mix. But he must have did an excellent job for that. Um, Tom McGowan, of course, playing... Pat Finley uh, was great. I, I think he looks even better now. I'm not so sure in recent years. Tim Blake Nelson, um, yeah, he was in this movie too. I know he went on to do a lot of work, but he's looking great. Jeffrey Tambor, yeah, looking quite different at his age, but he's still with us. Joseph Wayne Miller, Passed away at the age of 36 in 2018, sadly. Um, but he's been best known for playing Salami Sam. He was great. And I really miss him so much. Uh, Jerry Stiller, along with Ann Mira. Ben Stiller's his parents. They were great. Ann Mira, unfortunately, passed away uh, at a very... Um, old age, but she lived very long, she will be missed. Uh, then you got Sean Weiss, and I know it, it's sad to say this too, because Sean Weiss um, has been recently, have been going through drug problems. He's not himself, he looks exactly like an old hobo, if you saw his recent photo, and I was like, I was really shocked, sad, devastated. It's, I mean, unbelievable. I guess he was feeling so depressed that this had to happen to him. It, it was a shocker. I hope he does get a lot of help. I really do, because he's such a great actor. He's been best known for playing Goldberg in the Mighty Ducks films. He was awesome in this film. I mean, this is Definitely the opposite of Goldberg here. <laughs> yeah. Keenan Thompson, of course, excellent actor, no doubt about it. I'm glad he wanted his longtime um, cast member choice for Saturday Night Live, and he's doing some TV shows in his career. In fact, he's going to end up doing a, a TV show of his own on NBC. So I'm proud of him. I love this actor ever since uh, he was in the Mighty Ducks films. Wants up in shows like All That and Keen and Kill. He was also in my other favorite film of his, Good Burger, with Kill Mitchell. <laughs> and he went on to do other stuff too. Well, Kill Mitchell's doing something on his own as well, becoming a stand up comedian and, and all. Um, David Bow. Um, I know he was in UHF, 
uh, with uh, Will Yankovic, but I know he's been in other stuff. I think he's doing fine. Um, Leah, Leah Leo, uh, very beautiful, and I, I could definitely say she's she's been in a lot of work. I know she was in the TV show VIP with Pamela Anderson. I bet she looks beautiful now. I hope so. Paul Feig. I met the guy, by the way. It was nice to meet him. I, I was shocked that it was him. I was like, the first time I met Paul Feig, I was like, I didn't even know that was him. I was like, I was shocked. Because I love this guy. I mean, not only did he brought in all these films, but he was in one of my favorite films of all time. And I know my friend um, uh, Brendan Mitchell, aka Wet Movie One, actually met him too, and he also met Aaron Schwartz as well, and he had to have him sign all the the Blu-rays of this film. I mean, this is also his favorite film too, and I don't blame him. That's why he also wear the Perkis Power shirt <laughs> too. Okay, Tom Hodge. I mean, yeah, he was been known for being in the movie. The Adam Sandler comedy, that was his first, called Going Overboard. Um, but he went on to do a lot of stuff, too. Um, he was actually in the TV show, um, which had, um, of course, uh, the late, great, um, what's her name? Valerie Harper, which started out as Valerie, or Valerie's family, and then it became the Hogan family. Yeah, this is a show that gave uh, Patrick uh, Bateman... His breakout role, and as of today, he's still the most popular actor of one of all. <laughs> yeah, but he was—he played one of his friends in, in the TV series, and so on. I think he's doing it right. Um, yeah, um, and he was in the uh, Critters Two, the main course, and Revenge of the Nerds Two, among others. So. Uh, Max Goldblatt, um, yeah, he's a director, and you got, uh, of course, Alan Colbert, who's been in numerous uh, Sandler films, you know, you often see him, he's always fun, yeah, Cody Berger, um, for those who don't know, he was in the, the movie National Lampoon's um, Christmas Vacation, he plays Cousin Rocky, uh, and yes, he also made an appearance on Home Improvement, which was nice. And he was in the movie Forever Young with Mel Gibson, which also has Elijah Wood and Jimmy Lee Curtis. And, uh, Lauren Michelle Hill, hard to believe, but she went on to become a Playboy model. And she went on, went on to do the show Fear Factor. Um, yeah, that was her. Um, <laughs> if you saw her in the movie, she was incredibly stunning. I, I couldn't believe it. Um, and yes, I did saw that Playboy video um, when she was dressed up as a cheerleader. And yes, you do get to see her in the nude. Well, Peter Berg gets a uncredited role. But he's doing great. I mean, he's directing so many movies. Uh, like The Rundown, uh, Friday Night Lights, which eventually became a TV series. Because he was the producer, too. The Kingdom. Lone Survivor. Yeah. But he was also been known for being in the film, and he was the lead, in Shocker. The Russ Craven the horror uh, thriller that's... That's uh, out of this world. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, as for the uh, critical uh, reactions the film has gotten, and I know it sucks too that, that it has to go there. When the movie first came out, um, it didn't get... Um, it got some praises. I mean, there was basically mixed reviews. I mean, luckily, half of the critics, I mean, like, for example, New York Newsday says it's hilarious, filled with non-self laughs, and I agree. It's on the cover, by the way. And there's also another 
critic quote saying no holds barred fun and I'm glad they, they put it into it. Cisco and Ebert have reviewed the film. I have a video um, review of that but it should be already up on, on the other website that um, that someone else had posted so hopefully I could find it. Um, they almost liked the film but they gave it two thumbs down. Maybe they just gave it a mixed review. Um, although I guess it was pretty nice where they, they go around saying um, well if you like this movie so much you wouldn't have to go around making fun of me call me fat or something like that. Uh, I, I'm sorry but uh, even then I disagree with Siskel and Ebert at times even though I respect their opinions. But hey these are the same guys who also have gave uh, other films uh, not a chance. I mean and then they go around recommending films that that we all hated, like Speed 2, Cruise Control. Um, yeah, I got a 29% on Rotten Tomatoes, which does not deserve... See, this is another example why, you know, I, I can't take Rotten Tomatoes too seriously. I can't, okay? I know it's a score. It's it's basically a tomato, a tomato meter. So they're just collecting, you know, critical reviews here and there but it just sucks that half of these are just rotten well half of these are positive but it deserves more positive than negative to me in this shoes though in this day and age this movie deserves a higher rating than 29 percent in fact it deserves pretty much in the same rating as uh, Ghostbusters 2016 or no or better yet a lot higher than that film. That's what it deserves. It deserves like maybe an 84% certified fresh or maybe even a 90%, whatever it takes. Okay? I don't care what anybody says, alright? And it's fine if you don't like it, okay? It's fine, but I still think it's a better movie than, than most comedies we're getting nowadays. Right? And if it wasn't for this film, then, then you're actually missing out. I mean, this is the main reason why they became so popular in the first place in the later run. <laughs> I mean, with John Apatel going around doing films like the 40 year version, Knock Up, and um, any other film that follows, I mean, you got like a big team. And they know they put a lot of work and energy into it. I mean, they, they did a lot of hard work putting this movie together. They really did. And I just wish, you know, people these days just have given them the respect it deserves. That's, that's what I'm saying here. Because there's a lot of films out there that doesn't get any respect. And that's why we go around defending them because we feel like, you know, it deserves a fan base that people will remember by. You know, especially what we're seeing right now with Alita Battle Angel. That became my favorite film of last year. You know, they're already struggling so hard by actually getting a sequel. You know, they they formed their, their fan base of hashtag Alita Army. You know, they, they were demanding for this. They saw the movie themselves. You know, a lot of critics were were not too kind for that film and they wanted this and they're the ones who wanted the film to fail they wanted it to flop even the the majority of people but for the minorities out there they want this film to win they want this film to to succeed to make more money than any other film out there but I know it's hard. I mean, they, they struggle way too hard. If people have went to see this movie, then that's exactly what they should be doing in the first place, you know? Have fun in their lives. And that's how I felt with Heavyweights, too. I, I wanted to see this film in theaters. I really did. So bad. Ever since I saw the advertisement. Ever since I saw the poster. Ever since I saw everything about it that features these actors because I went to see the Mighty Ducks films. 
I wanted to see this movie so bad. And and this is the movie that got me interested in, in the fact that it had Ben Stiller in it because I saw his TV show. And I love the fact that he's playing a villain who's over the top, but yet, you know, you could tell that he had a lot of energy. And this is his best performance that he ever got. <laughs> I wish he won an Oscar for this one, if you think about it. <laughs> I know, I know, but it's it's hard. But the fact is, though, and I know this is a long video, but I just... This is why we needed movies like this. If it wasn't for um, this movie, we would have never have Judd Apatow and company do a lot of popular stuff. We would have never had any of these actors do a lot of special things. You know, a lot of popular comedies that follow. Ben Stiller, if it wasn't for this film actually, I don't think he would have been able to do comedies like, uh, for example, because um, it's as hysterical as it could be, there's something about Mary. Yeah, and that's the film, hard to believe, I had to see, you know, Ben Stiller who's been known for playing Tony Perkis would wound up uh, getting, <laughs> beating up a lot of slapstick that went into, you know, always getting attacked by a dog. Had to lift up uh, a uh, refrigerator or, or shelf or whatever. Or having to get beat up by a bunch of cops or or getting the yank with uh, <laughs> a fishing pole. And not, not only that, but he would have gotten to play the role of, of a very similar character called... Uh, for the movie uh, Dodgeball. That character that he played, who's also a fitness guru, is exactly like the character that he played in this movie. And you know that he enjoyed it. He also has the voice. The way he, he came up with that deeper voice of his was like, wow, stunning. <laughs> like, it, it brought me chills to my spine. <laughs> yeah, it really did. And Tropic Thunder, you know, this was a film that also has an inspiration for Ben Stiller to actually do uh, a take on war films. But what it would have been like if you had to do a war film behind the scenes. You know? uh, even that fake trailer that he did, which almost feels like, yep, this is Tony Perkis, all right, as a buff of action hero. Even has that deeper voice where he says, who left the fridge open? Okay. Um, here's another thing I, I love about this film, too, is that it definitely had a lot of heart. And you can definitely see that the friends themselves, you know, Josh, Roy, um, Cody, and all the rest of the gang, I mean... Now you know exactly how they feel. I mean, you feel bad for them. You feel sorry for having to struggle so hard, but nevertheless, they're really cool characters. You care for them. You love them. You want to hang out with them. I mean, imagine if they had a reunion to Camp Hope. I mean, think about that. You know, it's like, think about that. If, if they were around, you know, you want to have them go back to camp and just relive all the memories that they have you know the good and the bad and and the ugly <laughs> uh, not really but a lot of fun memories that they had I know they did a film like that with uh, Indian and Summer yeah the one with Bill Paxton which is the big chill of summer camp films but I would have imagined if that was like that, too. <laughs> now, you can find this movie on Blu-ray. You can pick this up at stores like Best Buy or any other place that they have it. Just look for it, and you can get it for a lot cheaper. You can even get it online if you have to, if you want this Blu-ray. And also, if you want the DVD, which, hey, that's what it is. Um, that's fine, too, but... Getting the Blu-ray is even better because you get all the features that you want and you have the freedom to spend time watching at any time. 
and also it's available on Disney Plus which you get the high definition transfer included but unfortunately you won't get all the features included so what's the point but hey if you're into streaming then you'll get to watch the movie and luckily IMDB gave it a 6.6 .6, but it really deserves a lot higher than that like maybe a 7.6 or may or even closer to 8.0 but I know I know I'm wishful thinking here okay I know I love this movie I can't help it <laughs> I hope this gets a 4k Ultra HD too it deserves one um, they need to put it in along with the blu-ray included maybe they can put all the features on the 4k release who knows maybe they'll have HDR of certain qualities I bet it's gonna look stunningly beautiful on there <laughs> okay so anyway and it's a long video it's heavyweights happy 25th anniversary February 17 2020 I'm Joseph A. Sabora and remember don't put Twinkies on your pizza because if you do it's gonna taste nasty Bye.